Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Uh, while waiting on our Lord to return, we're studying together in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. The, the great chapter on the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in this video, I would, I'd like to begin at verse 9 of chapter 15. The Holy Spirit has Paul remind them of his, dec uh, uh, his declaring the gospel to, uh, to, to them, uh, a gospel which was preached in which they received and in which they stand. Uh, those are perfect tenses uh, with the inevitable result that they are standing uh, by which they are also saved, delivered, rescued, if they keep in mind what was preached to them. Uh, it's important that we keep in mind that the context here is Christians, not non-believers. And then the Holy Spirit has Paul go through a, a bunch of appearances. I do not believe that those appearances are there for some proof of the resurrection of, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. But they're there to remind those who know and love the Lord uh, those who believe His Word, that Christ not only rose from the dead, but He was interested in His own. He appeared to His own. He didn't appear to, to Pilate. He didn't appear to Herod. Uh, didn't appear to His enemies. Didn't even appear to the high priest, you know, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were in control in the government. He appeared to his own disciples, as well as others uh, who, who came to know him and were his followers. And that seems only natural. I mean, why should he appear to those who, uh, who were his enemies and, and those for whom he had performed no work? Uh, he died in the place of his own. Uh, Paul declared that he was delivering God's Word. Uh, this was God's Word, not his own reasoning or logic, uh, that he was called to complete the Word of God. He told the Thessalonian uh, church that he was so thankful that they had accepted what he said as what it was, the Word of God. So it is God who's saying through Paul uh, and about Paul, I am the least of the apostles. I'm not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. You know, the other apostles, they didn't persecute the church. And Christ said, follow me. They followed him. They spent years with him. Paul didn't have those years of fellowship with the Lord or with the disciples. Uh, I am the least of the apostles. Shouldn't be called an apostle. You know, because I persecuted the church of God. But in verse 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. By God's grace, I am what I am. And we know Paul was a highly educated man. You know, he excelled as a Pharisee above all, all other Pharisees, a student, a serious student of the Scriptures. He, he could have boasted about that. But what he says is, by God's grace, I am what I am. I'm what God made me. By God's grace, I am what I am. I wonder how many of us can say that. And that grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than all of, all of them, all the rest of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. I love how the Holy Spirit clarifies who's doing the doing here. It does mean all of them put together. They're, all of together, their work doesn't equal to Paul's. Now, I believe Paul wrote that. I'm not really certain that he wanted to write it 
I don't think I would have enjoyed writing that. And so, so God makes sure that He adds, but it wasn't me. It was the grace of God which was with me. Okay, God could take a highly educated Jew who spent much of his life persecuting those who, who professed to believe in a resurrected Christ. You know, changing him into an apostle, a preacher of the gospel. You know, one who actually completed the Word of God that God used to complete His Word. And folks, you know, as much as that word doctrine is hated today, if we study doctrine at all, you know, Timothy, take heed unto doctrine. The only place that you really get it are in those epistles that the Holy Spirit had Paul write. You know, if we did not have the letters to the churches, we wouldn't be able to build a, a consistent theology. Couldn't be done. And God did that with Paul. He completed the Word of God. It's amazing how little time Christians spend in the epistles. It would be an incomplete word if it were not for God through Paul completing the Word of God. Therefore, verse 11, it doesn't make any difference whether it was me or them. So we preach and so you believed. He there says that that what they believed is the truth that the other apostles taught as well as he himself. And that's what we believe. That's what we believe because that's God's Word. You know, what they were preaching and what they believed was God's Word. And the 13th verse, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. So that 13th verse now begins now since, that's a first class condition, since Christ has preached that He rose from the dead, there's no, there's no argument there. That's what they preached. Not only Paul, but the other apostles preached that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So how is it then that some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Uh, nothing mysterious about that. Uh, this is so clear, it really doesn't need a whole lot of exp you know, explaining. Christ was preached as one who rose from the dead, and yet there were those in Corinth okay, who didn't believe that there was a resurrection from the dead. Now, automatically, we want to say those, are, those can't possibly be God's people. Uh, but I would beg to differ. There are many who believe that the concept of the resurrection of Christ is sort of, well, it's sort of a spiritual concept. It's, you know, it's, it's you know, God meant what He said, but it's not literal. You know, even though they profess to be Christians, after all, if we accept the premise, and we should, that He's God Almighty incarnate, then there's something different. You know, got to be something different about God incarnate. So, you know, His resurrection wouldn't be like our resurrection. And folks, the problem with that is they lose sight of the fact that Christ, and we're looking at God here, okay? Christ in the flesh, God Almighty, was manifest in the flesh. So, so let me just refresh your memories just a, a little bit. You know, many of you have followed us through some of our other previous uh, uh, studies, our playlists on other books of the New Testament. Ephesians 2, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man of the two, one new man, so making peace. Uh, if you followed us through Colossians in the first chapter, in the body of His flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. A wonderful verse. Uh, 1 Timothy 3. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest 
in the flesh. Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. 1 John uh, chapter 4, And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. Doesn't say they are the Antichrist. They have the spirit of the Antichrist. Now look, I don't see how God's word could be any clearer that God incarnate, creator of heaven and earth, the majestic God of all eternity, became flesh. You know, we know in John that he became flesh and he tabernacled among us. He 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 said to his disciples, "Touch me," and you know, and and see angels. Uh, you know, uh, or not spirits, I believe. Said, don't, they, they don't have flesh and bone. That Christ came in the flesh, the, the, that fact that He came in the flesh is intrinsic to solid biblical understanding and He died in our place. And I think any serious Bible student, when you speak of the cross of Christ, you know, immediately his mind you know, immediately goes to God, God incarnate, walked among men, he proved himself to be the promised Messiah. He, he died on the cross uh, in our place and rose from the dead. And that's what the cross of Christ means. And we're to carry that cross, folks. That's what it means to, to bear your cross, to carry your cross. He was flesh like we are flesh. That's what the Scriptures say. So you can't say that there is no resurrection of the dead. But, verse 12, uh, that's what they're saying. They're saying there's no resurrection of the dead. And many, many people who profess to be Christians start out with a, a presupposition that there is no resurrection. And so, you know, they spiritualize somehow, you know, either the, the empty tomb or the resurrection of Christ. The Holy Spirit is saying here that what is proclaimed is a resurrected Christ, and if Christ rose from the dead, and that's again, that's a first class condition, since he rose from the dead, he died a death like, like we die. He died on the cross. He actually died. He, he dismissed his spirit, his body was put in the tomb. It, it wasn't in the tomb long enough to be subject to decay. And that tomb was empty because that body rose from the dead. And if that's true, and, and we had all of these apostles saying it's true, you know, we met him, we saw him face to face. Uh, I mean, let's say they're right. All right, verse 13. If there, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ isn't risen, then what we've proclaimed is vain. And your faith also is vain. There's that word vain again. We saw it early, early in the chapter, I believe in verse 2. If you go back to verse 2, what I preached unto you unless you had believed in vain. Okay? And the word vain there means without purpose, without content, is what the word means. What you believed is without purpose and without content. So here's a, a simple statement of fact. If there's no resurrection of the dead, uh, let's, let's assume that's true, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ hasn't been raised, if he's not been raised, then what we preached is without content. It's, it's without purpose. Our faith is without purpose. Our faith is without content. Dearly beloved, I want you to imagine, uh, if you can, I want you to just try to imagine uh, not believing Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That is, you know, believing something that is absolutely without content. 
I think that the point that God wants us to see here is that everything collapses if there's no physical, literal resurrection from the dead. I believe the Scriptures make it clear that the foundation, the very foundation of what we believe is certified by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's, it's important in every one of the epistles. And if there is no resurrection, then your faith is without content. And we have no hope. More than that, verse 15, uh, and we are, yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ whom He did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. So we've testified against God saying He raised Christ when He really didn't. You know, the conclusion then in verse 16 is, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. If He isn't raised, your faith is useless. It's without use. You're yet in your sins. And we have no way to pay the sin debt. We have no way to pay that penalty. Jesus Christ died in our place. Was that death that He died, was it sufficient? Not if He didn't rise from the dead. If He, had, if he stayed dead, that's, but that's tantamount to saying whatever price He paid was not enough. But if He rose from the dead, then we have the hope of a resurrection. Look, look what it says. Your faith is vain. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. And, you know, we, of course, we've been told that we would not perish. There's no judgment for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. Why? because the price that He paid was sufficient, and it, because that price that He paid was sufficient, He rose from the dead. If it hadn't been sufficient, He would not have rose from the dead. But He rose from the dead. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, if, if that's all it is, we are, uh, we are of all people most to be pitied. If our only hope is in this life, and death ends it all, you know, you just die and that's it. There's nothing else then we're to be pitied because we have believed something that's false. And I'd hate to be, folks, I would hate to be on the side of those who find out, try to imagine, you know, they find out that what they believed their whole life was really not true. If in this life only, this life of flesh, we have a, we have a hope that's vested in Christ and, but, you know, but then some don't think He rose from the dead. We're, we are appointed to be pitiful. Okay, We are most to be, to be pitied. Okay, Think of that. Because we put our faith in something that's not true. So Christ is being preached as one who rose from the dead. And yet there are those who say, even today, there, there always have been, there's there is not there's not really a resurrection from the dead and if and if there's no resurrection then those those preaching it are wrong they're preaching against god their preaching doesn't have any content any value really whatsoever and they're found to be false witnesses because they're preaching that god raised up christ when he didn't when he didn't do that and so we among all people are most to be pitied because, well, we've we put our trust in something that's, that's not true. What a horrible thing, concept to think of, that we put our trust in something that is not true. But don't miss the underlying necessary fact that Christ came in flesh. He was our kinsman redeemer. His flesh was like our flesh. His bone was like our bone. Okay, 
we have a God-man sitting on the throne in heaven. Jesus Christ, he, who rose from the dead. And He's in heaven as our kinsman. So we are not people to be pitied, but, but people who, who ought to rejoice. We should be rejoicing in the fact of what Christ did. But many Christians do not rejoice over what Christ did on our behalf or on their behalf. What do you or I need to know to go to heaven? Well, dearly beloved, to me, the answer to that is nothing. In order for me to go to heaven, it is absolutely necessary that I be God's child, and it is inconceivable to me that I could be God's child by any other means other than being born by God from above or being born again by the Word of God and by the Holy Spirit, and I didn't have anything to do with those things. Since that is a true truth, and I believe it is, I don't believe man goes to glory uh, to be a son of God by anything that he did any more than he's a son of his parents by anything that he did. The gospel, that is the good news. Okay, this is what the chapter we're in. This is what we are looking at. This is what we're reading. It's what we're studying. It's not an invitation to uh, goats to become sheep. Nowhere in this text is that a, an invitation to a goat for him to become a sheep. We are reading what Christ did for us and why it is to our benefit that we believe God concerning it. You know, reassuring us our faith and preaching is not in vain. It's that it's not without purpose. The Holy Spirit, through Paul, is not evangelizing the saints here. Okay, He is writing to saints. The ones that he's writing to are saints. So let's go back to chapter 1, verse 2. Okay, I can't give you any reason for us studying the Scriptures other than because he told us to. I can't understand why his people wouldn't be intrigued and driven passionately, in fact, to learn more and more about the one who loved them so much that he died in their place. You know, me, you know, who hardly anybody knows. I mean, the governor of Oklahoma doesn't know who I am. He doesn't know me. Uh, the Pope doesn't know me. But the sovereign, majestic God of all eternity, he knows me by, and he knows me by name. And He loved me so much. And he, and he loves me, present tense, so much, that He died in my place. He's not only been raised from the dead, but He's the first fruits of them that slept, is what we're reading in our text. And you know what the first fruits are. right? And now we can go back to the Old Testament. You know... Uh, Anybody could sit there back in Israel's day and say, you know, you know, why do we have this first fruits thing? Why did God do that? You know, if I were there and they asked me, if they asked me that, I'd, I'd tell them, well, if you, if you live 2,000 years later in my day, I can tell you why He did that. You know, and it was so that I could rejoice in the fact that my resurrected body is going to be like His. He was the first fruits of those who have been put to sleep. Put to sleep. I love the language the Holy Spirit uses. They didn't die. He put them to sleep. They didn't put themselves to sleep. And that's a perfect passive. God put them to sleep. And He's the first fruits of that. If you go over to Philippians chapter 3, for our citizenship is in heaven, or our conversation, if you've got the King James, is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body. He's the first fruits. He's the evidence, okay? You could call it, say that. He's the evidence of what our resurrection body is going to be like. It's what, what it's going to look like. Uh, verse 21 
For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Well, Adam was told that the minute that he sinned, he'd die, and he did. By man came death. By man also came the resurrection of the dead. Well, uh, how many died in Adam? Verse 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And folks, we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to worry about that. They shall be all made alive. The Holy Spirit tells us, for as in the Adam, that's, and this is articulated, all die in the same way, in the Christ, it's articulated, shall all be made alive. You know, it's one thing to be in Adam. It's another thing to be in Christ. Uh, being in Adam, that's everybody. Right? It's, it's a, no, it's not, it's, that isn't everybody. So the two alls there are different. All of those who are in Adam died, and all of those who are in Christ are made alive. And the all that died in Adam includes the all that were made alive in Christ, but the all that are born again does not include the all that died in Adam. Okay? I don't know how often I've stressed the importance of context here. Verse 23. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Afterwards, they there are Christ's at his coming. John chapter 5, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall awake. What did he mean by, by all? Well, all that are in the grave shall awake. You know, if the verse stopped there, we could just just as easily conclude that, that the all that are in the graves are His. All that are in the grave shall hear His voice and shall come forth. That's They all hear His voice. Okay, They will all come forth. Those that have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil, to the resurrection of damnation. Romans 5, chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. That's, that's, that's basically where we are in 1 Corinthians here, in our present study. As in Adam all die, by one man, Adam, sin entered the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men. Oh my, why, that's, that's not fair. That's just not fair. I mean, why should I die because of what Adam did? You know, I'm sure I would have done something different than what I, you know. Clearly, we were in Adam. Suppose, suppose I destroyed Adam, you know. He no longer exists. You know, well, we wouldn't either. You know, that'd be it. So, the, you know, the whole human race is vested in Adam. Since Adam died, we all died. And that's what it says. You know, when he sinned, we all sinned. It's that simple. All sinned. So all died. Uh, clearly, Adam didn't die physically when he sinned. The minute that he sinned, the whole race died. But... That's a spiritual death. A separation from God. It's interesting how the word death means separation. We know it was separation from God. He fled. He hid from God. You know, the word death means separation. But clearly we see the loving God reaching out for those who are His people, His own, who died in sin. And through one act of righteousness, one act, through one single act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. You died in Adam, folks. You had no say in that. Okay? You were made alive in Christ when He died. You had no say in that. Didn't matter if you were in Christ or not. 
born. I mean, it's not. I I don't know if I'm explaining this right. Adam's transgression was removed in Christ. Okay, when he died. So it makes no sense to to sit around and bemoan the fact that you were made to die in Adam when Adam sinned because you were also made alive in Christ. Okay. No sense in blaming your lost predicament on on uh, on Adam. Okay? On or more specifically on God who who killed Adam and made you alive in Christ since since the sin of Adam was placed on all the human race. What happened when God removed it? What happened? Justification came on the whole entire human race. Folks, why are we willing to say everybody died in Adam and yet we're, we're not willing to say that when Christ removed Adam's transgression, that you know, he, didn't, he didn't remove it for everybody, but, but he did. He did. If he didn't, you would have to explain to me how Christ could die in Adam's place and not remove Adam's condemnation for the human race. But, but if he did not, and, and I don't see how that could possibly be, then everybody who is not in Christ is going to hell and there, there's no way out. You know, it doesn't matter how they live. Doesn't matter how they live. Doesn't matter whether they, you know, accepted Christ or they rejected Christ. They're, they're dead in Adam's sin. Dearly beloved, the entire human race died in Adam. And the entire human race was made alive in Christ. You don't hear that preached, but that's what the text says. So, so why won't everybody be in heaven? Well, it, that won't be because we, we sin in Adam. Adam's transgression was removed when Christ died. But, but, there comes a time, there will come a time, there, there did come a time in our lives when the commandment came, sin revived, and we died. We died. That's Romans 7. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me every lust. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. I died. Not Adam, okay? But me, okay? And now I need born again. And folks, that is a work of God. Just, dearly beloved, just as God willing that Adam would sin was a work of God. That I would sin in Adam was a work of God. Christ removing Adam's transgression, well, that was also a work of God. My being made alive in Christ when he died, was also a work of God. My dying in my own sin, the law finding me out, and me dying in my own sin, Romans 7, that was just as much a work of God. My being born again from above is most definitely a work of God and His never forsaking me is also a work of God. So, sorry, okay? We don't get any of the credit, all right? Many people say, you know, well, nobody goes to hell with the possible exception of Adam. Well, Adam can't go to hell because Christ died in his place. It's, it's already obvious from Scripture that Adam's transgression was removed. So, as hard as it may be to understand, you got to realize that nobody goes to hell because Adam sinned. Nobody, nobody. It's a fantastic truth, but we don't we don't but but we don't need to know that. You don't need to know that in order to go to heaven. It's a, it, you know it's a thrill to see the lengths to which our God went for our redemption. 
uh, Romans chapter uh, 7. I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Well, how was Paul alive once? For I died because I was made alive in Christ. But at some point, I died in my own sins. Nothing, in, folks, nothing dies unless it's first alive. Okay? Now, where there's no law, we know that where there's no law, there's no transgression. And we, and we also know, we also know that the strength of sin is the law. And because you can't keep the law, and I can't keep the law, you know, unless we think we're better than Israel, you know, because law keeping is the strength of, uh, that is, it, it fuels the fire of the old fleshly sin nature. That's why we died to the law through the body of Christ, of which we are members, one body, and He's the head. He's the head. You know, you may be an eye, folks, you may be a foot, but you are definitely not the head. And most Christians are trying to be the head. Folks, you don't have the ability to be the head. You don't have the so-called free will to undermine, nullify, overrule the sovereign will of the Almighty God any more than, than you have the ability to, to stop sinning, uh, or you have the ability to make yourself born, or again or unborn again but but you greatly have the ability to think that you do or to even think that jesus never rose from the dead whether he died in your place or he didn't folks you are not the captain of your own ship of your own private yacht you know, propelled by your own self-determined course of action or, or navigation, you know, you know, like you're going to arrive at heaven's gate because because you did everything right, or or because you understood everything correctly. No. You know, and, and now we go to, you know, now we're in in the classroom. You know, where the teachers want to impress upon you just the opposite. You know, that in the end, it's you that holds the final trump card, so to speak. You know, that you, you're, you're, not, uh, you're not only the captain of your own ship. You know, I mean, you, you, you uh, actually designed and, and built and, and launched, you know, uh, the ship. And you set sail on it, even, even with prayers that you would safely arrive at that destination. I mean... So this is God, the Holy Spirit, saying Paul was once, not over and over and over again, but he was once alive in Christ. Not I was once alive and happy in my relationship and my communion with Christ, and uh, you know, but you know, I, I went to Baghdad and and I saw this gorgeous belly dancer, and all of a sudden the lust of the flesh, you know, the lust of of the eyes and the pride of life and I, I sinned and you know and, and now I died and so you know I was I was no longer in fellowship with God some professor that that I was listening to said you know this probably happened to Paul over and over and over and over over again you know alive dead alive dead you know and that, dear friends in Christ, that makes absolutely no sense to me at all. Okay? You know, well, so, so, so much for getting an easy passing grade from your, you know, from your professor. It may make sense in the foolishness of my reasoning, but, but my God tells me that He died in my place that I, and, and I cannot die. No man shall separate me from my heavenly Father. Can't happen. Can't happen. Dearly beloved, if I go to hell, it's going to be a disaster that this creation has never known. Because, because Christ will be a liar. Can't happen. I think God has Paul write exactly what was true in Paul's life. 
Why was he alive? Why was he alive? Because Adam's transgression was removed when Christ died. There wasn't anything to kill him until he sinned. When the commandment came, sin revived, and I died, says Paul. So isn't it clear that that infant goes to heaven until it sins? I think there's every bit of biblical evidence, I've done videos on this, that suggests that an infant goes to glory. Why? Because Adam's transgression was removed in Christ. And I think that is a wonderful truth. I believe in Christ everyone was made alive until they sinned, and then we don't and then now we need born to be, we need to be born again, okay? And if you're not born again, well, go over to Jude and you'll see what you are. You're twice dead. You know, you have that in Jude. They're twice dead. And I, I believe that's what that means. I, I can't make I can't make that read, you know, you got some that are dead, you got some that are a little more dead, and you got some that are really dead. Like and these are really, really dead people, you know. Some are so dead, you know, but these guys, they're really, really dead. No, no, no. They were twice dead. They died in Adam. They died in their own sin. So if they're not born again, they're twice dead. So every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterwards they that are Christ's at his coming. At his coming. I believe those, those two groups are the church and Israel. That's, you may have a different view on that, but that's what I believe. Verse 24, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Every man in his own group. Those that are Christ said is coming, the church as well as Israel. Then those at the end when He shall have delivered up the kingdom to the Father. Okay? The end. Uh, that's when the eternal state begins. Which is, which is when the unrighteous dead at the end of the thousand years, this is when they're, they're raised in judgment to be condemned and you know, the great white throne judgment, okay? Uh, it's not a very good note to end on, I suppose, but knowing that our resurrection is to life, not condemnation, I think that's where we're going to stop right now. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into Your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, so thankful for Your Word, for the Gospel by which we are saved. I ask that You would just filter out all that which is foolish, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.